It is a both familiar and changed sight after 13 years looking out from this perch. Uh, it's a little disturbing to hear that what I thought of as new members are now called old timers. <laughs> And I certainly look out and realize many old timers I remember now worship with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light. A Renaissance man before his time, David was a superior warrior and military strategist, a musician and poet, traditionally credited with as the author of many of the Psalms a city planner laying out Jerusalem as a new capital city of the kingdom. He turned heads. He was a looker, according to the Bible, handsome, ruddy, with beautiful eyes. David's place in Israel's history is summed up in the first book of Kings. David did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and did not turn aside from anything that God commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. That sordid tale which the lectionary appointed for last Sunday, and I checked and you didn't hear that, last, that lesson last week, but it's key to this story about David. If you can remember in ancient days of yore when politicians still experienced shame and disgrace for their shenanigans, this was his. The matter of Uriah the Hittite was his Monica Lewinsky, his Watergate footnote, always mentioned in summing up his political career. In a nutshell, David's plotting and scheming succeeds. Uriah the Hittite, sent to the front line of the battle at David's direction, is now dead. And his widow, Bathsheba, mourns him for a brief but proper period. And when her mourning is over, David has his trophy wife already pregnant with his own son. In the absence of grand juries and special prosecutors, the secret is safe. He has literally gotten away with murder. But that's when today God's prophet Nathan comes knocking at David's door. We don't know how it is that Nathan knows, but Nathan knows. Prophets of the Lord are like that, I suppose, sent by the one who knows but if you are Nathan, how exactly do you confront the king? Especially one who clearly has no qualms about using his ultimate power against any and all enemies. Hamlet was not the first to use a bit of fiction, the power of story, to catch the conscience of the king. It's Nathan's task, it seems, to help David resuscitate his conscience and sense of justice. So if Nathan is to succeed, David must see himself as he really is and pronounce judgment on himself. So like Hamlet, Nathan spins a bit of fiction about a poor man whose sole possession in this world was a little ewe lamb, not so much a farm animal as it was a pet, like the daughter to him, and about a rich man with all the livestock he could ever want, but who couldn't turn loose of so much as a little lamb chop to feed the traveler who's come a-calling. And so the rich man takes the poor man's lamb to feed the guest. And David is outraged that anything so egregious and pitiless should have taken place in his noble kingdom. Restitution of the lamb fourfold is not enough. This villain must die. And Nathan replies, you are the man. With that, the trap has sprung shut, and the sputtering King David recognizes himself, and all he can say is, 
I have sinned against the Lord. And somehow with those words, he is on his way back to life. He shouldn't have been. After all, he's blown off three commandments in short order. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. But even though David has pronounced his own death sentence, Nathan reminds him that death is not what God has in mind for him. The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Granted, it will be anything but smooth sailing for David from here on out. But the story is as old as humanity and as contemporary as now, because we always seem to want more, even if it's to our own detriment. More money, more food, more toys, more oil, more fun, more youth, more profit, more power, more land, more. In the scripture today that we hear, it is David's morning after, figuratively at least. He is confronted by Nathan's parable and he convicts himself. I have sinned against the Lord. And now he sees that his wanting has been his undoing. Now for Jesus, in our gospel story, it is literally the morning after. The morning after Jesus fed 5,000 men and who knows how many women and children, that day with stomachs full and the mob, the, <clears throat> the mob had rushed to make him king and he had been forced to flee across the lake with his disciples. But those who have tested, those who have tasted, I'm sorry, those who have tasted this wonder bread are not about to let him go even if he's headed across the lake. And can anyone blame them? These are hungry people who can barely scrape together any meals most days. They're hungry, literally hungry. Their families are hungry. Their children are hungry. Rabbi Jesus is a meal ticket. Jesus has the potential to lift one of the basic burdens of their hand-to-mouth existence. He can at least keep them from starving to death. And if he can do that, perhaps he can do more. Maybe he can provide clothing and shelter too. Maybe he knows where they can find a steady job. Of course they want more, just like you and me. They want security and safety. They want to be protected against the pitfalls of human existence. So they spent the night in pursuit and when they track him down the next morning, they wonder aloud why he has fled. Rabbi Jesus, when did you come here? And they know their scriptures. Rabbi Jesus, they say, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it was written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. But Jesus, ever the failure as a seeker-friendly pastor, says... You're looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You spent the night in hot pursuit because to you, I represent a free lunch. You can't stop wanting. You saw what happened yesterday at mealtime, and you figure there's more where that came from. You followed me for the wonder bread. But if that's all I am to you, you're following me for the wrong reason. Following Jesus for all the wrong reasons is still a pretty common operating procedure. The Emperor Constantine, I suppose, is the classic historical example, drafting Christ into literal battle against his enemies. But we've made a more subtle art of it. Our culture has become the consummate expert at casting a pseudo-Christian veneer over its excesses and its shortfalls its sins of commission and omission, and its unexamined patriotism. Jesus becomes the way to garner votes, whether for a Christian America or for political engagement on behalf of the poor. 
Our churches trumpet that we, what we have to offer, whether it's a strong children's ministry or the right kind of worship or engaging programming for seniors or a friendly welcome. We're good marketers, but Jesus will have none of that. He doesn't make it easy for those who seek him. You ate your fill, and yet you're hungry again. There is food that perishes, and there is food that lasts. Work for the food that endures. That can be a hard saying for those of us who have pretty much everything and need little, if anything, when it comes to life's essentials. Hard for us who don't even know what we want some of the time, and yet we can't stop wanting Okay, Rabbi Jesus, if that's the case, how do we do that? What must we do to perform the works of God? You know, for all the bad rap of misunderstanding the crowd gets, I have to give them credit. They ask the question. They ask the question that every one of us wants to ask, and they ask it for, forthrightly. What do we do? What does it take, Jesus? What must we do? Tell us. Show us. We want to understand. What does it take? I'd like to know, wouldn't you? But it's, well, I suppose a bit like when John Calvin was asked to explain the Eucharist, Holy Communion. Tell us. We want to understand the bread and the wine at the table. But Calvin said he would rather experience it than understand it. Now that's not always easy for us moderns who think that we have an inalienable right to understand and comprehend most everything. With the right smarts and methods, we, shouldn't, we should be able to get it. But Jesus answers, I am the bread of life. Do they, do we hear the echo from the fiery bush? I am. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I am the bread of life. That's the simple answer he gives, simple but not easy. Maybe to feed on Jesus, to find our primary sustenance in Jesus, is something even deeper and better than to understand him. Remember the question, what must we do to perform the works of God? In Jesus, life is lived as God would live life if God were present with us in flesh and bone and blood, which God is. It's the essence of the incarnation. Our bread, our wine, our fullness of life stands before us in the crucified and risen one. He is the bread we need, even though sometimes he does not seem to be the bread we seek or want in our endless quest for something more. We may prefer our gods high and lifted up. We may prefer our religion spiritual and mystical and beautiful. But what we get in Jesus is something uncomfortably, messily, incarnate, a life lived by a principle that can be ours just as it was for Jesus. Humble yourselves and God will exalt you. Start with nothing but open hands and open minds and open hearts. Start from the cross. Humble yourselves and God will exalt you. Don't be afraid to feed others just as I have fed you. Don't be afraid to speak the truth in love. Don't be afraid to let others find the bread of life in and through you. Amen.